Well, that's a hell of a movie, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, I, I just want to say thanks to the projectionist. Uh, I mean, seeing the 70 mil roadshow version of Hateful Eight, what an incredible thing. Uh, what an incredible way to bring back the atmosphere and, and the beauty of seeing a film in the theater, just amazing. Well, you know, the way you, you said that and, and throw it to the projectionist, I throw it to the projectionist too. And by the way, we, we've had a long association uh, with the projectionist here at the DGA theater because one of the things that ended up happening was uh, we made this film and uh, as I'm editing it, I didn't want to get used to watching it in the Avid. I always wanted to remind ourselves what we were doing and why we were doing it and how big the film was so there wouldn't be any big, oh my God, what the fuck's that doing in this frame, <laughs> all right, uh, when we got to it. So one of the things was um, uh, every Wednesday, they screened our work print here about basically where we were up until that point. And uh, so I got used to seeing it on this screen. Every Wednesday, we would see where we were up to that point. And so we screened it here many, many times. So this was the theater that we did all of our, uh, our, our, our testing on and all of our just kind of just getting used to seeing it this way. And these projectionists were just really, really amazing. So let's just give them a, a round of applause. So this really is home then. Yeah, it really, this That's, really is home base for me, actually. That's great. Um, well, just to start, I, I wanted to ask you about whether you found, and it's a bit of a leading question, but whether you found the, the format itself that you shot on, 65mm, 5 perf, uh, with those special lenses. Um, my feeling in watching this film is it felt like it had uh, an increased level of formalism, I suppose I'd say. There's, there's a, a real calm and thought to where the camera is always. Um, and it's also perhaps in the music having a score uh, for the first time. That, that there is a, there's a great sense of the history of cinema in it, but also, as I say, this kind of calm and this kind of formalism. Do you think that was related anyway to the choice of format or is it the other way around? Or? No, I think you're probably right. I actually, uh, uh, man, I like what uh, I like the adjective you're saying about calm, especially <laughs> compared to this movie. Actually, it's, 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 it's lovely, but I do, I do know what you mean. Um, there is uh, that aspect about this movie. I tried not to change that much of how I do what I do just because I was working with this big of a format or just mm -hmm. because I was working in 70. I found myself, um, the only two movies I watched as far as other films that use uh, 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 Ultra Panavision uh, 70, um, the only ones I watched in preparation for this was It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, which I always was a big fan of, which was shot with these lenses. I mean, literally these lenses. And, um, and I watched uh, Battle of the Bulge, which was shot with these lenses. Mm. And, um, and I decided not to, um, I didn't, I decided not to treat editing any different. I tried not to treat, try mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, cinematically not treat anything that different. And one of the things that was really nice about dealing with the Weinstein company in here is uh, I've usually come from the aspect that film is the cheapest thing on the set, so I'm not going to worry about hoarding it. I'm just going to shoot the way I want to shoot. Um, I wasn't cavalier when it came to shooting in uh, uh, the 70 millimeter footage. I wasn't cavalier about I didn't waste it, but I didn't really like, you know, I didn't save it. I didn't uh, mm -hmm. uh, a bank it per se. I, I, I did what I needed to do. If I needed to do it over again, I did it over again. Um, I, I didn't think about stuff like that. Um, however, you know, there is a thing about it, frankly, that um, you don't need to cut as much yeah. because there's much more information in every single shot. Now, I didn't really think about, I didn't plan on that in advance, but I never really plan on my, un unless I'm trying to pull off some sp very specific wowy shot, mm -hmm. I never tried to plan on that in particular. So it just became, okay, I'm, filming Joe Gage talking to whoever, and then we would just frame it at that moment, at that time. But one of the things that did come across that was very interesting, and I was very proud of it when I looked at it uh, put together later, was, um, you know, using, once you're in Minnie's haberdashery in particular, is 
there's always two series of scenes going on. There's the actor, there's the characters who are in the foreground of the scene, and that is what the scene is is about, and that is the uh, uh, their area that they're dealing with. But then there's there there are the characters that are in the background of that scene, whether it be Joe Gage at his table or whether it be uh, uh, John Ruth and Daisy at the bar. And that is very important because I am trapping these characters together. And they are, you know, chess pieces on a chessboard to some degree. And if the suspense is supposed to work, and by the way, if the suspense doesn't work, then the movie's going to be boring. So there really has to be this uh, uh, sort of Damocles of violence that is hanging over the entire movie and you're waiting for it to fall. And when is it going to fall? And when it does fall, what does that mean? And what does it happen? And I don't want you to know the answer to those questions, but you are waiting and you're waiting and you don't even know what you're waiting for. Um, but I, I, I believe knowing where all the characters were in any given moment, unless I didn't want you to, was a very, very important part of it. And, and I just did it organically, but frankly, I don't think I would have done it as well. I don't think I was as good of a director when it comes to blocking in the 90s <laughs> as maybe I am now, but from having done, uh, this is my eighth movie, having done eight movies, I've, I've gotten a little better at it, and I think in areas like that, it showed it the most. But where um, the only limitation I had from how I'm used to working is, because uh, I, I, I I never had a situation where I was bummed out by how big the frame was. <laughs> that was never the right. situation. I was always just luxuriating in it and just yeah. loving looking through the viewfinder and just loving it. I mean, literally loving it. Um, my only limitation that I had, and I don't even think of it as a limitation now, but maybe I did the, the first half of the movie, was uh, we didn't have a zoom lens. Mm. And I'd really gotten used to using a zoom lens, you know, the, the small creep of a zoom and everything. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know... Uh, uh, does that, I mean, that forces you to think about uh, physical proximity on the camera. It so does. you want a close-up, you've either got to swing a lens or physically move closer. Yeah, well, I've been using it very psychologically as like a little tiny creep that you don't quite perceive right. until all of a sudden you realize the, form, uh, the format is different. All of a sudden you realize the composition is different. You know, or I do a Hong Kong boom, all right, in there. But I do that, I like doing that. That's a cool thing. Um, having said that, though, um, I don't think it was the worst thing for me at this time of my life to not have a tool that I'd come to rely on, all right? Mm -hmm. I think there was a, a, almost a liberating aspect. No, I can't do it that way with that. But one of the things that that forced uh, uh, me and Bob Richardson to do, which he was very happy with, and I was very happy with too, um, is we used a crane the way you'd use a zoom. We used a crane the way you would use a dolly. We yeah. used a crane the way you would use Steadicam. But once you took out the back wall and you could have the ass of the crane do everything, then we did everything on the crane. We shot, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a moving in close up of this bottle would have been done on the crane because why fucking not? It's so <laughs> magnificent. I. I felt like I was Max Ophis out there, just you know, swirling around on the crane, and it was lovely. So wh where did you shoot it? You're talking about a techno crane. So obviously, then not the techno crane. No, I'm talking about the one where the dude is on it. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I never. I don't crane? like the techno crane. I don't like yeah, the techno yeah. crane. I like. So it's Bob Richardson flying in the air like Eli Cross and uh, the wow. stuntman, all right, uh, with his white hair just. <laughs> Did you have that second directorial seat? Did you get to ride too? No, I, I don't. I would never do that to my grips <laughs> to deal with my fat ass, you know, uh, up there along with Bob's. I wouldn't do that to my crew. I, I care for them too much. So I let Bob be Eli Cross and go, How tall is King Kong? <laughs> so, how did you uh, get the tie in shots? Did you build the set on location and yeah. on a stage? Yeah. Literally we built the whole thing twice? Or? Absolutely. We built it twice. We built it on. Um, in that mountain range where you saw it, um, in Colorado, and and thank God we did. I mean, I, that was always the idea. I mean, if I had completely my druthers, what I would have done is I would have shot the entire movie in Colorado on the set and then came to Los Angeles and shot the entire movie again, at least interior-wise, <laughs> in Los Angeles. I compromised a little bit, all right? Uh, <laughs> But it ended up helping us out because um, 
as you can see, we got all the weather that we needed, but it was mercurial, and we had to wait a while to get the weather. So, uh, and there were like days upon days upon days where just the sun was out, and that was what we were dealing with. And then on those days, we just went into minis and just kept shooting and kept making it through the piece. And so basically all the, the daytime stuff uh, was shot in Colorado. Then once it became night, then we uh, moved to a set in um, uh, Los Angeles and shot mm -hmm. it. But the good part about the set in Los Angeles was because the weather was mercurial in Colorado, you, know, you couldn't count on the breath all the time. Mm -hmm. However, once we were in Los Angeles, we could make the, the set as cold as we wanted, so we got breath every day, every <laughs> shot. All right, the, the cast was always drinking hot tea all the time, all the time, you know, but that was also right because, well, now it's nighttime, so now it actually is bitterly colder. So right. then that was when the breath needed to emphasize everything. Right, well, it gives a great, great sense of, of space and, and location. I think it's incredible. I particularly love, you know, when the camera pulls back the window at sunset, you know, yeah, yeah. takes you around. It. Oh, really. I think it's one of the more, more beautiful shots, just seeing yeah. kind of that orange light you know, peeking through the the slats yeah. in the uh, the the uh, uh, the walls. Oh, it's absolutely absolutely beautiful. Um, this project, I mean, famously or infamously, the script leaked. You did a very well received um, reading of the script with uh, some of the actors who are in the film. Yeah, with most of them. Yeah, with most of them. Um, did the script change much from that point? Did that inform your process in some way? Uh, did it develop in different directions, or is it, or is this? basically the script that, that you did with the reading. No, it's not the script I did in the reading, um, but, but it didn't change because of that. Um, one of the things that, that disturbed me so much about the script leaking at that time, why it was such a, a kick in the shins to the process I was putting in place, was uh, I decided to write the script differently than I'd ever written a script before. Normally, I'm, I'm connected to this script the way somebody is connected to a novel and you work in this long way till you get to the very end and then it's boom, that's it. And that's kind of how I've done everything for at, at the very least, uh, um, I, I think it's for all the script, uh, yeah, I've, all the way back to True Romance, that's pretty much how I've done it. Um, and I decided on this one to do, do it a different way in so far as, um, when you get to the ending, when you get to the last 30 pages, and you know, it was always like, well, whatever happens is what happened. I've been writing it for this long, and now I know the characters, and they dictated that this is what happened, and that's what happened. I decided, I, uh, um, let me not do it that way this time. I wanna spend time with the material. And I made a decision to write three drafts of the script before I like let it out and say, okay, this is what we're making. So the idea was to go through a first draft, and then a second draft, and then a third draft, and to just basically spend time with the material and just see how I felt. And, and maybe that ending would be different three different times, but I like the idea of telling the story three different times and seeing what would happen from it. And I, just to give you an example in that regards, um, the, uh, the Lincoln letter, which became an important part of the movie, and the first draft was only brought up in the stagecoach when John Ruth reads it, and that was it. Because I really wasn't ready to do anything further with it, but I knew I had a couple more drafts so that I could think about it. So it was just brought up there. I remember my agent reading it, and he was like saying, you know, that's a really neat idea. You really should do more with it. I go, well, I, I, I intend to, but I'm gonna get there. I'm, I'm not quite ready yet. And um, so th when that draft got released, that's why I, I reacted so badly. Because it seemed like they were, it seemed like they were truly fucking up this process that I was trying to do. They were kicking me right in the shins. Mm. I, I got over it, um, um, and um, you know we had the script reading and it was pretty well received, and uh, and that gave me a lot of confidence in the material. As did rehearsing it for three days with the actors mm. before the script reading. Um, but I still had, uh, you know, I still had a ways to go. And like just to give you an example. Um, what we end up doing with Daisy, i.e. hanging her, mm. was always my conception that, you know, uh, they would fulfill John Ruth's destiny by hanging her, which is her sentence, per se. Um, that was always my idea. However, 
as I got to that last chapter in the first draft, I questioned, is that misogynistic? Not that I think Daisy needs a whole lot of, of you know, take care of her. <laughs> um, but I, I, I questioned, well, do I know Daisy enough to kill her that way? I don't know if I know Daisy enough to kill her that way. Uh, I don't know if my own biases as a male maybe are, are, are playing into this. Um, so she ended up dying in um, kind of a random way, in a way that wasn't like a big buildup to a big conclusion. She died a little bit more arbitrarily. I think basically, I think if I'm not mistaken, in the first draft, she, when, when she gets shot in the foot, in this chapter, he just shot her dead. All right, and I, there, was, there, there seemed the real integrity in the arbitrariness mm -hmm. of taking her out in that way. And so that was the end of the first chapter. Now, I liked that and I thought that worked, but I still wasn't satisfied. I still liked the idea of the hanging. Um, so then I did a second draft. And in that second draft, not getting tricky about it, but I wrote it from Daisy's point of view. All right, and I didn't. I don't think I played any games with the prose, but me myself, the writer, was looking at it from Daisy's point of view, and to me, Daisy was the audience figure in it. And, and I didn't really change her personality, uh, but she was the audience figure, and it was my attempt to really get to know her. Now, in that version, Mannix ended up dying, and it was Daisy and Warren that had the moment at the very end. They're both going to die, but, uh, but uh, uh, they were the, the last survivors of it. And when I finished the second draft, I felt I really knew Daisy. I knew who she was. I had no uh, mysteries about her. I felt really good. And then I knew I could kill her. <laughs> then I knew I could hang her from the highest beam in the haberdashery and feel okay about it. But I needed to go through that. Fair enough. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about influences. Obviously, there's a danger in asking you about influences, getting a lot in response. <laughs> but I, there, were, there were two films that, that I just wanted to mention, one of which will bring me to the music, because the first was Key Largo, mm -hmm. which I had never seen, just happened to watch right before I saw this. Oh, no kidding. Wow. Know, That's an interesting weird, weird correlation. Yeah. I know. And I, so I, I was going to ask you about that. But also, as I watched the film, uh, I suddenly, when I saw that Ennio Morricone had done the music, I was thinking, oh, okay, obviously a great history of Westerns and everything. Um, but I, in watching the film, I suddenly thought about The Thing. Mm -hmm, yeah. And I wondered if you were a fan of that, whether with Kurt Russell and everything. There were just a couple of things that I felt, felt. Yeah. Oh, well, like, homage. Yeah. And then now, and look, in particularly, um, The Thing is probably the one movie that is the most influential on this movie, per se, as a, as a movie. Um, in a lot of ways, I was influenced mostly, more than any other movie, there's not that many movie. Uh, touchstones of this one. The thing is absolutely yeah. the thing and Reservoir Dogs are absolutely the two right. biggest. And actually, Reservoir Dogs was very much influenced by the thing, so that goes a long way. <laughs> um, the biggest influence that I was holding on during the writing was I was always was a big fan, and I've been a big fan, especially in the last six or seven years. I've watched a lot of them um, of the Western American Western uh, TV shows from the '60s. And one of the things about those Western TV, like the Virginian and Bonanza, Gunsmoke, one of the things that was interesting about those shows in particular is uh, the ones that I like to watch are usually ones that have guest stars that I'm a big fan of. And so, you know, if you watch a, a, a Virginian episode where um, William Shatner is the guest star or Robert Culp is the guest star, um, William Shatner is the star of the episode. It's about him. The story of that episode is about him. And Doug McClure as Trampas or uh, uh, Michael Landon as Little Joe are uh, supporting characters. They're, they're, they're uh, either the 
antagonist of that character or they're helping that character out. But the thing that was interesting about these guest stars, like Vic Morrow or James Coburn or, or uh, uh, any of these fellas, when they would show up, Charles Bronson, is um, these guest stars would show up. The story would be about them, and they were always there was an unknown quality about them. We didn't know who they were. They weren't just the blacksmith in the town. They were always entering the town. And then at some point in the first act, you would learn something about their past. They had a, an interesting, shady, controversial past of some kind. And you didn't know how true the story was that you heard or not true the story was you heard. But you didn't really know about them. And usually, it was a situation, the whole second half of the story was, are they a protagonist or are they an antagonist? Is Michael Landon gonna end up being his friend and help him by the very end? Or is Michael Landon gonna end up killing him at the end because he's a bad guy? That concept of a character became very, very interesting to me. And I thought about what if I could take eight of those characters <laughs> and trap them in a room during a three-day blizzard where if they try to leave certain deaths, so they have to deal with each other. They all have a backstory. We can't trust a fucking thing, they say, and we can't trust anything that they say they are. And we just have to figure it out as we watch the story. Yet, there is no Doug McClure. There is no James Arness. There is no Michael Landon. There is no moral center. There is no hero that you can gravitate towards. There only is these guest stars <laughs> that you have to deal with. So that was the epitus going forward. However, the, the thing cannot be ignored. It's the only movie that I showed the cast in so far as like, okay, here's... You didn't show it to Kurt Russell. I did show it to Kurt Russell. <laughs> he loves the thing. So he also, and he loved watching it with the cast because he was just, yeah, that's my baby, that's what I did. <laughs> but the thing about it was, um, uh, you know, but I mean, but there's so many things that, that uh, are applicable to it. Uh, but uh, because of the setup, the, the, the cold, the snow, Kurt Russell, you know, Morricone, the fact, the paranoia going on. But, but truly, and I was trying to do this in Reservoir Dogs as well, um, the real correlation to the thing isn't those elements. It was the way I felt watching the thing the first time I saw it in a movie theater. And my metaphoric way of, of breaking down my feelings of that, because I was really, I, I was really connected to that movie. I thought it was crazy suspenseful, suspense leading almost to terror in a weird way that suspense rarely gets to. Mm -hmm. And I thought part of the reason for that was no one could trust anybody else. And the paranoia amongst the characters was so strong. And it's trapped in that enclosure for so long that the paranoia just bounced off all the walls until it had nowhere to go but the fourth wall out into the audience. And that was what I was trying to achieve with Hateful Eight, was to bounce that paranoia around until it has nowhere to go out but here. <laughs> well, I think you achieved it. I appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, Key Largo, anything to say about oh, that? Oh, no, 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 very much so. I mean, like, you know, Key Largo, um, I mean, frankly, to tell you the truth, uh, you know, I, I, I would say, actually, like, the three plays would be... A, uh, a, a trifecta of Key Largo, uh, Petrified Forest, and Iceman Cometh to one degree or another. Um, but that theatrical hothouse quality yeah. was what I was going for. Oddly enough though, again, getting back to the jumping off point of um, these Western TV shows of the 60s, every series, at least once a season, a bunch of outlaws would take over the Ponderosa <laughs> and hold everybody at bay like they do in Key Largo or take over uh, Shiloh Ranch on uh, the Virginia. There's one in Virginian in particular called the Invaders. That's a in particularly cool one uh, where these bad guys take over the Shiloh Ranch and the bad guys are Darren McGavin and David Carradine. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Um, 
we were talking outside about Ennio Morricone a little bit, and I'd like to share that with the, the audience. Um, this is the first year of films where you've used a, a score in this way, and I think it's incredible and, and marvelous. And the question I'd asked you is uh, whether Morricone had done all the music for the film, uh, whether it was all done bespoke, and, and you were starting to tell me about, about that process of it. Well, it was interesting because uh, we'd flirted with working with each other for a while, but this seemed like the one to do. I had a little little uh, 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 voice in my head saying, this material deserved an original score. Uh, and I've never thought that way before. I never had that voice in my head before. Um, I didn't ever want to trust a composer with the, the soul of my movie. Um, what was different here? Just I, the feeling. I, no, I think it was the material. Mm -hmm. I think there was something about the material. Um, I guess the word integrity comes to my mind, not to say that the other films aren't full of integrity, but I mean, there was something about this one that just, yeah, it was just, uh, it was the little voice. It was just this little voice that said, this is, this is the one. And, um, and so, uh, so I took the first step, which was getting the script, within the first step with Morricone is getting the script translated into Italian. And uh, I sent it to him, and he read it, and his wife read it, and he really liked it. And his wife really, really liked it, which actually might have been the proper <laughs> way to go. <laughs> and um, then I got together to talk with him about it. And, uh, and the first thing he said was, um, well, look, uh, I want to know where you're coming from here, because you don't use a composer who writes a score that takes you from beginning to end. Um, you take other people's scores and you use them the way you want to use them and you do a pretty good job with it and people seem to like it, so why would you want to change? And I go, well, I mean, frankly, to tell you the truth, I'm not 100% sure I do want to change, but I do want to talk to you about it. I want to explore it with you. You are my favorite composer, and I don't mean movie composers. I mean compared to Beethoven. I mean compared to Schubert. You are my favorite composer. Um, and if it's ever going to work, it's going to work with you. But if it doesn't work with you, then I'll do it probably exactly that way. However, I did mention the little voice. that said the movie deserved a score of its own. And so then we started talking, and he thought that I hadn't started to shoot yet. Little did he know I'd already shot, and I would, I'd need the score in a month. <laughs> And he's like, well, this is not going to work. I'm working with Giuseppe Del Toro, and he just finished shooting the other day, and I got to do his score. I mean, this is not going to work. I was told a lot, a lot of things that aren't correct, and I'm really sorry. And I go, well, well, so am I. But, you know, we're having a nice time and talking. And I go, well, okay, well, look, tell me what you thought about the script. And so he starts talking about the script. He goes, yeah, you know, so I, I, I had this idea for a theme when I was reading the script that I actually thought was kind of intriguing and blah, 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 blah. blah. I go, well, wait, wait, let's go back. That theme that you said you heard in your head. <laughs> Um, what was it? And uh, and he goes, well, you know, uh, and, and I'm sure he was referring to what we used in the opening credits. Um, he goes, well, you know, I just I see a theme that that that's moving forward. It's 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 uh, there's a forward momentum to it that suggests a stagecoach moving forward, moving forward. But the important part of the theme is the fact that it truly suggests the violence that will follow eventually. Well, that sounds pretty fucking good. You know? uh, uh, <laughs> so the more we talked about it, he said, uh, um, well, you know, hold it now. Hold it, hold it. You know, um, Giuseppe's going to take at least two weeks to put his uh, assembly together for me to see. Um, here's what I can do. I, 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 I can maybe write the theme for you. I, I'll write the theme. And uh, and I had already talked to him about the the carpenter theme, all right, the carpenter uh, music for the thing. And then he told me a story. And he goes, "Well, you know, the thing was he came and showed me the movie and whatever." Uh, 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 then I wrote a whole orchestra score and I wrote a, a, a whole synthesizer score because I knew that was what he was used to. And I gave him everything. And the only thing he used in the entire movie was the synthesizer main title. So basically, if you stay away from the synthesizer main title, all that music that's on the soundtrack album, The Thing, has never been used in a movie ever. Really? So, <laughs> he goes, uh, 
what I can do is I'll write the theme, I'll give you a, a mixed version of the theme, I'll give you a version of the theme that's just brass, I'll give you a version of the theme that's just strings, and then with the other thing of pieces of music, now you have your original score that's never been used in a movie before. <laughs> and I go, wow, that sounds fantastic, all right? So that was kind of the deal, and that's what I thought would happen. But then we were at an award show the very next day, and I saw him the next night, and he came up to me and he goes, I'm gonna write you more music. And I think, I think he literally sat down that night and started composing the, uh, uh, the theme that he was talking about and got more inspired mm -hmm. and came up with more music. And then all of a sudden, 10 minutes of music became 17 minutes of music, became 35 minutes of music, mm -hmm. all right? And so with that and the unused thing portions that I used uh, is my original score. Wow. <laughs> Well, I could sit here and talk with you all night. Unfortunately, we've been giving, giving the wrap-up. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for an incredible film, uh, for all of your work. And thank you very much for coming to talk to us tonight. Oh, it's my pleasure.